Well, you finally made it. After all that training, you're ready for your first skydive. Full of confidence, you reach the door of the plane as it gets to 12,000 feet. You step off into the air, but at the last second, you hear the instructor screaming something. Sorry, I didn't check your chute. Well, you can't hear him as you drop away from the plane, seeing only his concerned expression. Well, feels like something has gone wrong. You pull the handle to release the parachute, but it hasn't deployed correctly, opening into a big wad, and you're now spinning faster and faster. You're getting dizzy, but you need to pull yourself together. Each second is crucial, and from this altitude, you have less than a minute to act. You throw yourself into the Bowman formation, spreading your body out with your arms and legs forming a big X. This creates a little more drag, allowing you to stabilize a bit. Hey, this whole thing is a drag. Now you have more time to get to your emergency reserve chute. Still dizzy from spinning, you try to remember where it is. You grab what you think is the right strap and pull it hard. Oh no, that's a leg strap! You've loosened the container on your back, and now you're slipping out! This is not your lucky day. You hold on and tighten up the leg strap. Oh yeah, the safety procedure is coming back to you now. Hmm, step one, cut away from the main parachute with the red handle. Done! Now you're in free fall again. Step 2. Now find the silver ripcord handle to pop the reserve chute. Gotta hurry, the ground is rushing up at you. Where's that handle? Whoops, there it is. Sitting on your chest on the left. You yank it hard. Ka-thump! The chute flies out and deploys and slams the brake on your descent. Now you're relieved. Breathtaking? Heart pounding? Oh yeah! Finally, you can enjoy the view for about 10 seconds before you land on the ground. Softly, feet first. Hey, looks like fun, sign me up. On another day, as always, instead of taking the stairs, you use the elevator. Now the odds of it falling are 1 in 10 million. You're 10 times more likely to be hit by lightning. But today, you're in that unlucky elevator. As you move down from the fifth floor, the pulley system fails, a cable snaps, and the elevator starts falling. Quickly, you lie down on your back, placing one arm around your head to protect it from the impact, and the other arm over your face to save it from possible falling objects. You spread your legs out evenly. In just a couple of seconds, you brace for impact. It crashes down, and debris from above falls around you. Fantastic job! You've avoided injury! But could it be possible to alter the impact by jumping? Well, let's think this through. If you jump too early, your impact would be more severe as your speed would increase in the descent. And if you jump too late, the velocity of your jump upwards would cause you to bump your head as the elevator would have stopped. You need to jump at the precise moment to be effective in velocity. And without the ability to see through steel, it would be down to sheer luck. So it's better to use the lie-down method. Yeah, good luck with that. You casually drive to work, passing over the same bridge as any other day. Today, there's more traffic than normal, and you're stuck in a jam. The bridge starts to creak. Unfortunately, it's possible for structurally faulty bridges to collapse under excess weight. And there you are. As the bridge falls into the river, your car floats on top. The water is slowly rising around you as it starts to sink. You're trying to remain calm and take a deep breath. You have up to two minutes before the car completely sinks. You need to act fast and roll down the window. As you take off your seatbelt, you notice the water has risen above the windows. You try to roll them down, but they're stuck in place from the pressure. You've missed your opportunity. You're sinking further down and thinking about opening the door. Hmm, better not. This will make your vehicle sink even faster. Plus, it'll be more dangerous to exit. The car hits bottom, and the water is slowly entering it. You try to open the door, but the pressure is so intense that it won't budge. You think about the water coming in. Maybe if you waited until there's enough water inside, it could regulate the pressure, allowing the doors to open. But with the limited air that would remain, and if the doors still don't work, that's too much of a risk. Your only choice is to smash the window. You can do it easily due to the water pressure, and it spills in quickly. You take your last deep breath while holding onto the window frame. The car fills in quickly, and the suction suddenly stops. You pull yourself through the window and place your feet on the car, push upwards, and swim to the surface. Yeah, remind me not to carpool with you. Next, you're out hiking in a forest, 
and find the perfect place to view the sunset. You take a photo and it looks great! But wait, which way is it back to camp? It's getting dark, and you have no idea how you got here. You check your phone. It has a map so you'll be fine, right? Well, you've taken way too many nature pics, and the battery has run out. You can survive up to 3 hours without shelter in harsh weather. You can go without water for 3 days, and up to 3 weeks without food. You need to address your next actions in order of importance. So your first task is to build a shelter. You lean a large stick onto a tree for the roof support. Then you build two walls on the sides, making a sturdy frame. There are plenty of leaves in the forest, and you cover the roof with heaps of them for insulation and protection. On the inside, you build a nice leafy mattress. You enter and wait until morning, hoping to have a relaxing sleep. Well, you've slept horribly. But there's no time to leave a review on your booking app. The next task is finding water. You follow a clear decline in the land, eventually finding a stream. Clean water? Check. You continue to walk with the stream's flow, hoping it leads you to a river. You are more likely to find people and signs of civilization along large collections of water. Hours pass, and your belly grumbles. You look around for tasty snacks. There are berries and mushrooms, but you don't recognize them. So it's better not to eat something if you're unsure whether it's poisonous. You search under old logs and branches for bugs. You've found some mealworms that can be eaten raw. Some insects, when cooked, can be a major source of iron, protein, and vitamin B12. You look at them, and your appetite goes away. Hmm, maybe later. Finally, the stream connects to a river, and just ahead of that, a bridge. Not the one that fell down. Well, the struggle is over. You throw the bugs away and begin the next adventure, finding a diner. Yeah, we're not going camping together either. Next, you're walking in a field. The wind is picking up, and not far away, a tornado is forming. You start running away from it, but you can't outrun it as it travels up to 60 miles per hour. Your main concern isn't the tornado itself, but the trees and buildings that the twister takes in, turning them into dangerous flying objects. They fly at crazy speeds as they're carried by fast winds, reaching up to 300 miles per hour. You look for shelter, but there's nothing available. Your only possibility is a ditch that's not surrounded by trees or other breakable objects. You lie wedged in a ditch and cover your head with your jacket, holding it down with your arms for protection. While lying flat, with that thundering noise around you, you feel like you're in a giant jet engine. It's a terrifying sound. But luckily, you're not in the tornado's pathway. You can hear the small debris whistling over your head, and many make an impact, thudding all around you. But thankfully, they miss. Suddenly, everything goes calm. You lie there controlling your breathing, trying to relax. You don't get up, not yet, as the worst may be yet to come. Tornadoes can last from several seconds to up to an hour. You're not taking your chances and remain in your ditch for the full hour. But finally, when it's clear that it's gone, you dust off your jacket and head home. Meanwhile, you're really bad luck, so I'm removing you from my contacts and unfriending you on social media. And I'll do that once I get out of the hospital. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Now, you know your odds of getting struck by lightning are 530,000 to 1. You already knew that, right? The chances that you will win the lottery at least once in your life are 500,000 to 1. The possibility of winning the lottery twice is almost zero. Now, this incredible story may seem like fiction since its events seem so unreal. It's unlikely that any director would want to make a film about this because the audience wouldn't believe it. You can easily find evidence on the internet if you don't believe it either. So, here we are in Australia in 1998. Meet Bill Morgan. He lives on the outskirts of the country in a trailer park. Bill works as a truck driver, so he gets behind the wheel of his car and goes off to work. During the ride, he feels unwell. Bill stops the car and loses consciousness. Somebody notices him and calls an ambulance. They take him to the hospital. Doctors immediately determine that Bill has had a heart attack. They give him the necessary treatment with medications. But Bill's condition worsens because of an allergic reaction. His heart stops. 
from a medical point of view, if it doesn't beat for 7 minutes, it means that a human has passed away. Bill's heart hasn't been working for about 14 minutes. It seems there's no chance, but doctors continue to fight for his life. And then a miracle happens. Bill comes to life. The heart is beating again, but the patient's brain doesn't show signs of life. Bill is in a deep coma. A few days have passed. Doctors understand that Bill has a risk of remaining in a vegetative state for the rest of his life. Even if he regains consciousness, his brain will still be damaged. Twelve days have passed. The doctors offer Bill's family to disconnect him from the life support machine, but they refuse to do it. At this challenging moment, the family meets a specialist from another hospital. He tells them about some experimental treatments that might help. They have no guarantees that Bill will survive, but at least they can try. The family agrees and transports Bill to another hospital. After being treated with the new medication, Bill spends another 15 days in a coma. Then, one day, he comes to his senses and goes on the mend. What happened to him is what doctors call a medical miracle. But real wonders are waiting for him ahead. He returned to his trailer park on Melbourne's outskirts and continued living there with his girlfriend Linda. Twelve months have passed. Bill works as a driver again. He proposed to his girlfriend and is preparing for the wedding. He gets into the truck and goes to the city on business. On the way, he stops by a store and buys a lottery ticket. He scrapes off the protective layer and realizes he's just won a Toyota Corolla, which costs about 30,000 Australian dollars. Wow! Bill can't believe his eyes. Considering Bill had health problems after a heart attack and couldn't work much, the new car was a great gift. A few days later, a local TV channel contacts him. Producers want to make a report about Bill. They were amazed not because Bill got a lucky lottery ticket, but because he came out of a coma before that. And so, reporters come to him, take a short interview, and then go with him to the city in the new car. The director wants Bill to buy a lottery ticket and erase it on camera so that later, during the editing of these shots, the announcer tells Bill's story. So Bill buys the ticket, goes to the table, wipes the protective layer with a coin. His eyes widen. He takes the ticket and reads it several times. I just won $250,000, he says, and doesn't believe it. The cameraman thinks Bill is joking, but he looks pretty serious. This is not a joke, he says. He shows the ticket. Yes, it's true. Bill won the lottery for the second time and did it in front of the cameras. You can easily find the video on the internet and see his reaction to the event. Bill calls his girlfriend and tells her the good news. With this money, he finally moves out of the trailer and buys a real house. Life is getting better. Bill has his real estate, a car, and a beautiful wife. He regularly buys lottery tickets, but wins nothing. At least, that's what he says. By the way, the luckiest person on the planet is Frano Selak from Croatia. One day, he was traveling by train. Something went wrong, and the train derailed. Several of the cars fell into the river. Frano miraculously survived. He was able to swim to shore and call for help. A year after these events, Frano was flying on a plane. Right in the sky, an emergency exit door ripped off the plane. Frano flew out with other passengers and was the only survivor. People found him lying in a haystack. They took him to the hospital. Frano has no serious injuries and left the hospital. A few years later, in 1966, the man had an accident on a bus trip. The vehicle left the road and fell into the river. Frano remained alive and unharmed. His adventures didn't end there. In 1970, he was driving his car on the motorway when his gas tank caught fire. Frano left the vehicle in time. It exploded in front of his eyes. Frano realized that some magic had been happening with his life. He lived quietly for the next three years. All this time, he felt that something else bad was about to happen soon. And he was right. In 1973, a fuel pump spilled gasoline on his car and body at a gas station and caught fire. 
Soprano survived again and got almost no damage. But there were two more severe disasters ahead of him. The first happened in 1995. This time, he wasn't driving the car or sitting inside the plane. He was just walking. He crossed the road and saw a bus moving towards him. It was too late, and the bus hit him. Fortunately, Frano survived. He wasn't surprised anymore and just wanted these accidents to stop. The last thing happened while driving his car on a mountain road. Suddenly, a big truck appeared in the opposite lane. It was moving towards him at great speed. Frano managed to jump out of the vehicle and stay alive. His car exploded, and he got minor scratches and bruises. It's hard to believe in such luck. Or maybe it was bad luck considering that Frano had been in disaster so often. In any case, many people decided to verify the authenticity of these stories. It turned out that nobody could confirm plane and train crashes. There were no reports of these incidents. Perhaps Frano invented all this or added some fantastic details to make his story more unbelievable. We'll never know the truth. But one thing about this man you can know for sure. After all these trials, Frano got really lucky. He won almost a half a million dollars in the lottery. He bought a luxury house, but then sold it. After all the disasters that he has experienced, he realized that money wasn't the main thing. He married five times in his life. And so, after selling the house, he returned to a modest home to spend the rest of his life with his beloved fifth wife. All the remaining money, Freno spent on a complicated hip operation and charity. Wow. Imagine if Frano had been an Uber driver. Would you get in the car with him? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Hey, future explorers. Let me tell you, some stuff might still be hanging around even 2,000 years later. Finland has an underground nuclear storage facility designed to last a hundred thousand years. Picture a massive underground tunnel system carved right out of solid rock. They wanted a solution that wouldn't burden future generations with constant babysitting in the area. This impressive place sits about 185 miles northwest of Helsinki. The engineers started planning it way back in the 1970s. They wanted to close up shop and decommission it in the 2000s. The heart of the crib is a spiraling track that's going to stretch three miles, diving down. To ensure maximum safety, they've got a bunch of multiple barriers in place. Steel and concrete structures are supposed to do the job. The waste fuel rods will be snuggled inside copper canisters with thick walls. These canisters will sit on a cozy bed of bentonite clay, which swells up when it gets wet. This way, it acts as a buffer against any geological shenanigans and prevents any pooling of liquid, which could corrode the copper. It's an incredible feat of engineering, and it's almost like creating a time capsule that will withstand the test of time. Kudos to the folks working on this even though they won't be around to celebrate when it's done. Maybe in the future, they will find a way to make it last for hundreds of years more. I mean, they started planning it in the 1970s, but in the future, it would be a totally different game. Let's move on to Italy. When you stroll into the Pantheon in Rome, it puts on a show just like it did almost 2,000 years ago. Now, let's rewind a bit. This structure went through some tough times. The first Pantheon caught fire and burned down not once, but twice. Some fellas even said it was cursed. The completed Pantheon was a grand masterpiece with Greek-inspired touches, like those fancy columns. But the real jaw-dropper was its gigantic dome. The largest unsupported concrete dome on the planet. Now, the Pantheon's original purpose remains a mystery. Some say it was a Roman worshipping spot, while others think it was where the emperor got his hotline to the deities. The massive eye on top, known as the oculus, lets in sunbeams and rain. 
Marble from all over the Mediterranean made it look snazzy, but the Roman concrete made the magic happen. Then we've got the impressive Hoover Dam in the USA, an architectural masterpiece. Experts designed it to harness hydroelectricity and prevent water from going where it shouldn't. This dam is built like a fortress, steel, concrete, and a lot of TLC keep it strong. Let's jet off to New Delhi and check out the Akshardham Temple, even though it's very young compared to the other structures I've mentioned. It was completed in 2005. It already has the characteristics of a building that can stand for a long time. During the construction, numerous ancient and modern innovations were used to ensure its endurability. Next on our list of the world's most future-proof buildings is the St. Louis Arch, which rises high over Missouri. Also known as the Gateway Arch, it is the tallest human-made monument in the USA. The Great Wall of China. While it's not a single building, the Great Wall of China is an ancient marvel that has survived for centuries. Some sections of the wall were reconstructed in modern times, but they still carry historical and cultural significance. Those bricks might look a little crumbly, but hey, they're still standing strong. Then we have the former Byzantine church, now known as Hagia Sophia from Istanbul. It still looks glorious, and it's 1,500 years old. It's been through many things, like earthquakes. Architects designed Hagia Sophia in an impressively short period. After the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in 1453, Mehmed II converted it into a mosque. He added some new stuff, like a minaret and a chandelier. Hagia Sophia is a unique architectural marvel. Its main dome is 105 feet tall and flanked by two semi-domes on both sides. In terms of its floor plan, the building is nearly square, but from the interior perspective, it appears rectangular because of the extension of the roof by large semi-domes. The interior has three aisles separated by columns with galleries above and substantial marble piers rising at both ends to support the dome. These columns are constructed of the finest marble, carefully chosen for their color and variety, while the lower walls are adorned with marble slabs. On the outside, there are windows above the galleries and around the base of the dome. When the sun's shining, it kinda tricks your eyes into thinking the dome is floating, because these windows hide the support structures. We couldn't have put together a list of the world's sturdiest buildings without mentioning perhaps the most famously enduring of them all. The Pyramids of Giza. They were completed around 2540 BCE. They've got the whole package. Superior materials, genius engineering, and a design that puts all other structures to shame. The ancient Egyptians were all about building for eternity. They believed that the afterlife would last forever, so they made sure their tombs would too. The Egyptians threw in extra walls and other stuff just to be safe, even if they didn't fully understand the laws of physics. Now, let's shift our gaze to our time. Can today's skyscrapers beat the pyramids in the longevity game? The Burj Khalifa in Dubai is the world's tallest building, it boasts impressive engineering and architecture, its reinforced concrete and steel structure, along with its iconic design, might help it withstand the test of time. Sure, skyscrapers are super tall and fancy, but they're not as sturdy as the pyramids. Modern skyscrapers need to deal with crazy winds, lightning strikes and earthquakes too. Experts haven't agreed on this yet, some say that if we take good care of them, they can last. But others think they'll eventually be torn down or abandoned. The verdict? Only time will tell. Alexander Rose and his team are up to something jaw-dropping. 
They're creating a 10,000-year clock in the Texan desert. But before we get into the nitty-gritty, let's take a trip to Japan. There, they have this fantastic tradition of rebuilding the Jingu Shrine with wood and thatch every 20 years for more than 13 centuries. It's to preserve the structures and pass on the craftsmanship to the next generation. But let's not stop there. Ancient artifacts and buildings from various cultures have survived the test of time, and each one has something to teach us. The Clock Project takes inspiration from these long-lasting wonders and aims to encourage us to think about our long-term future. Building a clock to last 10,000 years is no easy feat. The team must consider materials, location, and past examples of long-lasting structures. For instance, some of history's unique treasures survived simply because they were lost and found later. Going underground is another way to protect artifacts. Subterranean environments shield items from the elements and keep temperatures stable. But there's one pesky problem, water. It's always trying to sneak its way in. Materials matter big time when it comes to longevity. You see, everything ages because of oxidation, which means rusting. So, finding materials that can withstand thousands of years is vital. How long buildings can really last depends on the building's personality and purpose. Take those fancy office buildings, for instance. They're all about short-term commitment, designed to last only 30 to 50 years. Just like with any relationship, it takes effort to make something last longer. Regular checkups, maintenance, and repairs are the key to keeping the spark alive. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.